Chapter 11 It was one Mai Zhu who said he knew how to defeat Cao Cao early. Mai Zhu came of a wealthy family of merchants in Danghai and trading and lying. One day traveling homeward from the city in a carriage, he met an exquisitely beautiful lady trudging along the road, who asked him to let her ride. He stopped and yielded his place to her. She invited him to share the seat with her. He mounted, but sat rigidly upright, never even glancing in her direction. They traveled thus for some miles when she thanked him and alighted. Just as she left she said, I am the goddess of fire from the southern land. I am on my way to execute a decree of the supreme god to burn your dwelling, but your extreme courtesy has so deeply touched me that I now warn you. Hasten homeward, remove your valuables, for I must arrive tonight. Thereupon she disappeared. Mai Zhu hastily finished his journey and, as soon as he arrived, moved everything out of his house. Sure enough that night a fire started in the kitchen and involved the whole house. After this he devoted his wealth to relieving the poor and comforting the afflicted. Tao Kain gave him the magistracy office he then held. The plan Mai Zhu proposed was this, I will go to Beihai and beg Governor Kang Rong to help. Another should go to King Zhu on a similar mission to get the help from Imperial Protector Chiang Kai. If the armies of these two places march on Cao Cao, he will certainly retire. Tao Kain accepted the plan and wrote two letters. He asked for a volunteer to go to King Zhu, and a certain Chen Deng of Guangling offered himself. After he had left, Mai Zhu was formally entrusted with the mission to the north. Meanwhile Tao Kain and his generals would hold the city as they could. Kang Rong was a native of Kufu in the old state of Wu. He was one of the twentieth generation in descent from the great teacher Confucius Kang Fusi. Kang Rong had been noted as a very intelligent lad, somewhat precocious. When ten years old he had gone to see Lai Ying, the governor of Henan, but the doorkeeper demurred to letting him in. But when Kang Rong said, I minister Lai Ying's intimate friend, he was admitted. Lai Ying asked Kang Rong what relations had existed between their families that might justify the term intimate. The boy replied, of old my ancestor Confucius questioned your ancestor, the Taoist sage Laozi, concerning ceremonies, so our families have known each other for many generations. Lai Ying was astonished at the boy's ready wit. Presently High Minister Chen Wai visited, to whom Lai Ying told the story of his youthful guest. He's a wonder, this boy, said Lai Ying, pointing to Kang Rong. Chen Wai replied, it does not follow that a clever boy grows up into a clever man. The lad took him up at once, saying, by what you say, sir, you are certainly one of the clever boys. The minister and the governor all laughed, saying, the boy is going to be a noble vessel. Thus from boyhood Kang Rong was famous. As a man he rose to be an imperial commander and was sent as governor to Beihai, where he was renowned for hospitality. He used to quote the lines, Let the rooms be full of friends, and the cups be full of wine. That is why I like. After six years at Beihai the people were devoted to him. The day that Mai Zhu arrived, Kang Rong was, as usual, seated among his guests, and the messenger was ushered in without delay. In reply to a question about the reason of the visit, Mai Zhu presented Tao Kain's letter which said that Cao Cao was pressing on Zhu City and the Imperial Protector prayed for help. Then said Kang Rong, your master and our good friends, and your presence here constrains me to go to his aid. However, I have no quarrel with Cao Cao either, so I will first write to him to try to make peace. If he refuses my offer, then I must set the army in motion. Cao Cao will not listen to proposals of peace, he is too certain of his strength, said Mai Zhu. Kang Rong wrote his letter and also gave orders to muster his troops. Just at this moment happened another rising of the yellow scarves, ten thousand of them, and the ruffians began to rob and murder at Beihai. It was necessary to deal with them first, and Kang Rong led his army outside the city. The rebel leader, Quan Hai, rode out to the front saying, I know this county is fruitful and can well spare ten thousand carts of grain. Give me that and we retire. Refuse, and we will batter down the city walls and destroy every soul. Kang Rong shouted back, I am a servant of the great hands, entrusted with the safety of their land. Think you I will feed rebels? Quan Hai whipped his steed, whirled his sword around his head, and rode forward. Song Bao, one of Kang Rong's generals, set his spear and rode out to give battle, but after a very few bouts Song Bao was cut down. Soon the soldiers fell into panic and rushed pell-mell into the city for protection. 
The rebels then laid siege to the city on all sides. Kam Wong was very downhearted, and Mai Zhu, who now saw no hope for the success of his mission, was grieved beyond words. The sight from the city wall was exceeding sad for the rebels were there in enormous numbers. One day standing on the wall, Kang Rong saw a far a man armed with a spear riding hard in among the yellow scarves and scattering them before him like chaff before the wind. Before long the man had reached the foot of the wall and called out, open the gate. But the defenders would not open to an unknown man, and in the delay a crowd of rebels gathered round the rider along the edge of the moat. Suddenly wheeling about, the warrior dashed in among them and bowled over a dozen at which the others fell back. At this Kang Rong ordered the wardens to open the gates and let the stranger enter. As soon as he was inside, he dismounted, laid aside his spear, ascended the wall, and made humble obeisance to the governor. My name is Taishi Sai, and I'm from the county of Leihuang. I only returned home yesterday from the north to see my mother, and then I heard that your city was in danger from a rebel attack. My mother said you had been very kind to her and told me I should try to help. So I set out all alone, and here I am. This was cheering. Kang Rong already knew Taishi Sai by reputation as a valiant fighting man, although they two had never met. The son being far away from his home, Kang Rong had taken his mother who dwelt a few miles from the city, under his especial protection and saw that she did not suffer from want. This had won the old lady's heart and she had sent her son to show her gratitude. Kang Rong showed his appreciation by treating his guest with the greatest respect, making him presents of clothing and armor, saddles and horses. Presently said Taishi Sai, give me a thousand soldiers, and I will go out and drive off these fellows. You are a bold warrior, but they are very numerous. It is a serious matter to go out among them, said Kang Rong. My mother sent me because of your goodness to her. How shall I be able to look her in the face if I do not raise the siege? I would prefer to conquer or perish. I have heard Liu Bei is one of the heroes in the world. If we could get his help, there would be no doubt of the result. But there is no one to send. I will go as soon as I have received your letter. So Kang Rong wrote letters and gave them to his helper. Taishi Sai put on his armor, mounted his steed, attached his bow and quiver to his girdle, took his spear in his hand, tied his packed haversack firmly to his saddle bow, and rode out at the city gate. He went quite alone. Along the moat a large party of the besiegers were gathered, and they came to intercept the solitary rider. But Taishi Sai dashed in among them and cut down several and so finally fought his way through. Guan Hai hearing their rider had left the city, guessed what his errand would be and followed Taishi Sai with a party of horsemen. Guan Hai spread them out so that the messenger rider was entirely surrounded. Then Taishi Sai laid aside his spear, took his bow, adjusted his arrows one by one and shot all round him. And as a rider fell from his steed with every twang of Taishi Sai's bowstring, the pursuers dared not close in. Thus he got clear away and rode in hot haste to Liu Bei. Taishi Sai reached Pingyun, and after greeting his host in proper form he told how Kang Rong was surrounded and had sent him for help. Then he presented the letter which Liu Bei read. And who are you? asked Liu Bei. I'm Taishi Sai, a fellow from Leihuang. I'm not related by ties of kin to Kang Rong, nor even by ties of neighborhood, but I'm by the bonds of sentiment and I share his sorrows and misfortunes. The yellow scarves have invested his city and he is distressed with none to turn to, and destruction is very near. You are known as humane, righteous, and eager to help the distressed. Therefore at his command I have braved all dangers and fought my way through his enemies to pray you save him. Liu Bei smiled and sighed, saying, And does he know there is a Liu Bei in this world? So Liu Bei, together with Guan Yu and Zheng Fei, told off three thousand troops and set out to help raise the siege. When the rebel leader Guan Hai saw these new forces arriving, he led out his army to fight them, thinking he could easily dispose of so small a force. The brothers and Taishi Sai with them sat on their horses in the forefront of their array. Guan Hai hastened forward. Taishi Sai was ready to fight, but Guan Yu had opened the combat. He rode forth and the two steeds met. The soldiers set up a great noise. After a few bouts Guan Yu's green dragon saber rose and fell and with the stroke fell the rebel leader. This was the signal for Zheng Fei and Taishi Sai to take a share, and they advanced side by side. With their spears ready they dashed in, and Liu Bei urged forward his force. 
The besieged governor saw his doughty rescuers laying low the rebels as tigers among a flock of sheep. None could withstand them, and he then sent out his own troops to join in the battle so that the rebels were between two armies. The rebels' force was completely broken and many troops surrendered, while the remainder scattered in all directions. The victors were welcomed into the city, and as soon as possible a banquet was prepared in their honor. Maizhu was presented to Liu Bei. Maizhu related the story of the murder of Cao Song by Zhang Kai, Cao Cao's vengeful attack on Zhu, and his coming to beg for assistance. Liu Bei said Imperial Protector Tao Kain is a kindly man of high character, and it is a pity that he should suffer this wrong for no fault of his own. You are a sign of the imperial family, said Governor Kang Rong, and this Cao Cao is injuring the people, a strong man abusing his strength. Why not go with me to rescue the sufferers? I dare not refuse, but my force is weak and I must act cautiously, said Liu Bei. Though my desire to help arises from an old friendship, yet it is a righteous act as well. I do not think your heart is not inclined toward the right, said Kang Rong. Liu Bei said, this being so, you go first and give me time to see Gong Sun Zan from whom I may borrow more troops and horses, I will come anon. You surely will not break your promise, said the governor. What manner of man think you that I am, said Liu Bei. The sage said, death is common to all, the person without truth cannot maintain the self. Whether I get the troops or not, certainly I shall come myself. So the plan was agreed to. Mai Zhu set out to return forthwith while Kang Rong prepared for his expedition. Tai Sai took his leave saying, My mother bade me come to your aid, and now happily you are safe. Let us have come from my fellow townsman, Liu Yao, imperial protector of Yangzhu, calling me thither and I must go. I will see you again. Kang Rong pressed rewards upon Tai Sai, but he would accept nothing and departed. When his mother saw him, she was pleased at his success, saying, I rejoice that you have been able to prove your gratitude. After this he departed for Yangzhu. Liu Bei went away to his friend Gong Sun Zan and laid before Gong Sun Zan his design to help Zhu. Cao Cao and you are not enemies. Why do you spend yourself for the sake of another? Said Gong Sun Zan. I have promised, Liu Bei replied, and dare not break faith. I will lend you two thousand horse and foot, said Gong Sun Zan. Also, I wish to have the services of Zhao Zilong, said Liu Bei. Gong Sun Zan agreed to this also. They marched away, Liu Bei's own troops being in the front, and Zhao Zilong, with the borrowed troops, being in rear. In due course Mai Zhu returned saying that Kang Rong had also obtained the services of Liu Bei. The other messenger, Chen Deng, came back and reported that Tian Kai would also bring help. Then was Tao Kain's heart set at ease. But both the leaders, though they had promised aid, greatly dreaded their antagonist and camped among the hills at a great distance, fearful of coming too close to Cao Cao's quarters. Cao Cao knew of their coming and divided his army into parts to meet them, so postponing the attack on the city itself. Presently Liu Bei came up and went to see Kang Rong, who said, The enemy is very powerful, and Cao Cao handles his army skillfully. We must be cautious. Let us make most careful observations before we strike a blow. What I fear is famine in the city, said Liu Bei. They cannot hold out very long. I will put my troops with yours under your command, while I with Zhang Fei make a dash through to see Tao Kain and consult with him. Kang Ron approved of this, so he and Chen Kai took up positions on the Ox Horn formation, with Guan Yu and Zhao Xilong on either side to support them. When Liu Bei and Zhang Fei leading 1,000 troops made their dash to get through Cao Cao's army, they got as far as the flank of his camp when there arose a great beating of drums, and horse and foot rolled out like billows on the ocean. The leader was Yu Jin. Yu Jin checked his steed and called out, You madmen from somewhere, where are you going? Zhang Fei heard Yu Jin but deigned no reply. He only rode straight to attack the speaker. After they had fought a few bouts, Liu Bei waved his double swords a signal for his troops to come on, and they drove Yu Jin before them. Zhang Fei led the pursuit and in this way they reached a city wall. From the city wall, the besieged saw a huge banner embroidered in white Liu Bei of Pingyun, and the imperial protector bade them open the gate for the rescuers to enter. Liu Bei was made very welcome, conducted to the residency, and a banquet prepared in his honor. The soldiers also were feasted. 
Tao Kain was delighted with Liu Bei, admiring his high-spirited appearance and clear speech. Tao Kain bade Mai Zhu offer Liu Bei the seal and insignia of the Protectorship Office. But Liu Bei shrank back startled. What does this mean? said Liu Bei. Tao Kain said, there is trouble on every side, and the kingly rule is no longer maintained. You sir are a member of the family and eminently fitted to support them and their prerogatives. I am verging on senility, and I wish to retire in your favor. I pray you not to decline, and I will report my action to the court. Liu Bei started up from his seat and bowed before his host, saying, Sign of the family I may be, but my merit is small and my virtue meager. I doubt my fitness even for my present post, and only a feeling of doing right sent me to your assistance. To hear such speech makes me doubt. Surely you think I came with greed in my heart. May God help me no more if I cherished such a thought. It is a poor old man's real sentiment, said Tao Kain. Time after time Tao Kain renewed his offer to entrust the region of Suzhou to Liu Bei, but Liu Bei kept refusing. In the midst of this came Mai Zhu saying, the enemies had reached the wall, and something must be done to drive them off. The present matter could await a more tranquil time. Said Liu Bei, I ought to write to Cao Cao to press him to raise the siege. If he refuses, we will attack forthwith. Orders were sent to the camps outside to remain quiescent till the letter could reach Cao Cao. It happened that Cao Cao was holding a council when a messenger with a war letter was announced. The letter was brought in and handed to him and, when he had opened and looked at it, he found it was from Liu Bei. This is the letter, very nearly. Since meeting you outside the past, fate has assigned us to different quarters of the world, and I have not been able to pay my respects to you. Touching the death of your noble father, it was owing to the vicious nature of Zhang Kai and due to no fault of Tao Kai. Now while the remnant of the Yellow Scarves is disturbing the lands, and Dong Zhuo's partisans have the upper hand in the capital, I wish that you, illustrious sir, would regard the critical position of the court rather than your personal grievances, and so divert your forces from the attack on Zhuo to the rescue of the state. Such would be for the happiness of this city and the whole empire. Cao Cao gave vent to a torrent of abuse. Who is this Liu Bei that he dares write and exhort me? Beside, he means to be satirical. Cao Cao issued orders to put the bearer of the letter to death and to press on the siege. But Guo Jie remonstrated, saying, Liu Bei has come from afar to help Tao Kian, and he is trying the effect of politeness before resorting to arms. I pray you, my lord, reply with fair words that his heart may be lulled with a feeling of safety. Then attack with vigor and the city will fall. Cao Cao found this advice good so he spared the messenger, telling him to wait to carry back his reply. While this was going on, a horseman came with news of misfortune. Lu Bu has invaded Yanzhu, now holding Piang. The three counties left Wan Cheng, Fengxia, and Dongjun are under severe attacks. When Lai Ju and Guo Si, the two partisans of Dong Zhuo, succeeded in their attack on the capital, Lu Bu had fled to Yuan Shu. However, Yun Shu looked askance at him for his instability and refused to receive him. Then Lu Bu went to try Yun Shao, who was a brother of Yun Shu. Yun Shao accepted the warrior and made use of him in an attack upon Zheng Yan in Changshan. But Lu Bu's success filled him with pride, and his arrogant demeanor so annoyed the other commanders that Yun Shao was on the point of putting him to death. To escape this Lu Bu had gone away to Zheng Yang, governor of Shangdang, who accepted his services. About this time Peng Shu, who had been hiding and protecting Lu Bu's family in Chang'an since his disappearance, restored them to him. This deed angered Lai Ju and Guo Si so that they put Peng Shu to death and wrote to Lu Bu's protector to serve him the same. To escape this Lu Bu once again had to flee and this time joined himself to Zhang Maio, the governor of Chen Liu. Lu Bu arrived just as Zhang Maio's brother, Zhang Kao, was introducing Chen Gong. Chen Gong said to Zhang Maio, the rupture of the empire has begun, and warlords are seizing what they can. It is strange that you, with all the advantages of population and provisions you enjoy, do not strike for independence. Cao Cao has gone on an expedition against the east, leaving his own territory defenseless. Lu Bu is one of the warriors of the day. If you indeed together attacked and got Yanzhu, you could then proceed to the Dominion. Chen Maio was pleased and resolved to try. He ordered an attack and soon Lu Bu was in possession of Yanzhu and its neighborhood, all but three small counties of Huancheng, Fengxia, and Dongzhan. 
which were vigorously and desperately defended by Sun Yu and Cheng Yu in concert. Cao Cao's cousin Cao Ren had fought many battles but was repeatedly defeated, and the messenger with the evil tidings had come from him asking prompt help. Cao Cao was greatly disturbed by this and said, If my own region be lost, I have no home to return to. I must do something at once. The best thing would be to become friends with Liu Bei at any cost and return to Yanju, said Guo Jia. Then Cao Cao wrote to Liu Bei, gave the letter to the waiting messenger and broke camp. The news that the enemy had left was very gratifying to Tao Kian, who then invited his various defenders into Zhuzhu City and prepared banquets and feasts in token of his gratitude. At one of these, when the feasting was over, he proceeded with his wish of retirement in favor of Liu Bei. Placing Liu Bei in the seat of highest honor, Tao Kian bowed before him and then addressed the assembly, I'm old and feeble, and my two sons lack the ability to hold so important an office as this. The noble Liu Bei is a descendant of the imperial house. He is of lofty virtue and great talent. Let him then take over the rule of this region, and only too willingly I shall retire to have leisure to nurse my health. Liu Bei replied, I came at the request of Governor Kang Rong because it was the right thing to do. Zhu is saved, but if I take it, surely the world will say I am a wicked man. Mai Zhu said, You may not refuse. The house of Han is falling, their realm is crumbling, and now is the time for doughty deeds and signal services. This is a feral region, well populated and rich, and you are the men to rule over it. But I cannot accept, said Liu Bei. Imperial protector Tao Kian is a great sufferer, said Chen Deng, and cannot see to matters. You may not decline, sir. Said Liu Bei, Yun Shu belongs to a family of rulers who have held the highest offices of state four times in three generations. The multitude people respects him. Why not invite him to this task? Because Yun Shu is a drying skeleton in a dark tomb, not worth talking about. This opportunity is a gift from heaven, and you will never cease to regret its loss, said Kong Rong. So spoke Kong Rong, but still Liu Bei obstinately refused. Tao Kain besought him with tears, saying, I shall die if you leave me, and there will be none to close my eyes. Brother, you should accept the offer thus made, said Guan Yu. Why so much fuss? said Zheng Fei. We have not taken the place. It is he who wishes to give it to you. You will persuade me to do what is wrong, said Liu Bei. Seeing he could not persuade Liu Bei, Tao Kain then said, As you are set in determination, perhaps you will consent to encamp at Tsiopai. It is only a little town, but thence you can keep watch and ward over the region. They all with one voice prayed Liu Bei to consent, so he gave in. The feast of victory being now ended, the time came to say farewell. When Zhao Zilong took his leave, Liu Bei held his hands alternately while dashing away the falling tears. Kong Rong and Chen Kai went home to their own places. When Liu Bei and his brothers took up their abode in Xiopai, they first repaired the defenses, and then they put out proclamations in order to calm the inhabitants. In the meantime Cao Cao had marched toward his own region AD 194. Cao Ren met and told him, Liu Bu is very powerful, and he has Chen Gong as advisor. Yanzhu is as good as lost, with the exception of three counties which Sun Yu and Cheng Yu are vigorously defending together. Cao Cao said, I own that Lu Bu is a bold fighter but nothing more, he has no craft. So we need not fear him seriously. Then he gave orders to make a strong camp till they could think out some victorious plan. Lu Bu, knowing of Cao Cao's return, called two of his subordinate generals, Zhu Lan and Lai Feng, to him and assigned to them the task of holding the city of Yanju, saying, I have long waited for opportunity to employ your skill. Now I give you 10,000 soldiers, and you are to hold the city while I go forth to attack Cao Cao. They accepted. But Chen Gong, the strategist, came in hastily, saying, General, you are going away. With a I'm going to count my troops at Paiying to establish an Oxhorn vantage. You are making a mistake, said Chen Gong. The two you have chosen to defend this city are unequal to the task. For this expedition remember that about 60 miles due south, on the treacherous road to the Tatian Mountains, is a very advantageous position where you should place your best men in ambush. A cow will hasten homeward by double marches when he hears what has happened. If you strike when half his troops have gone past this point, you may seize him. Said Lu Bu, I'm going to occupy Pying and see what develops. 
How can you guess my big plan? So Lu Bu left Su Lan in command at Yanzhu and went away. Now when Cao Cao approached the dangerous part of the road near the Tatian Mountains, Gu Jia warned him, saying, Do not advance hastily, my lord, there is doubtless an ambush. But Cao Cao laughed, saying, We know all Lu Bu's dispositions. Zhu Lan is keeping the city, while Lu Bu is massing his troops at Paiying. Do you think Lu Bu has laid an ambush? I shall tell Cao Ren to besiege Yanzhu, and I shall go to Paiying. In Paiying, when Chen Gong heard of the enemy's approach, he spoke, saying, The enemy will be fatigued with long marches, so attack quickly before they have time to recover. Lu Bu replied, I, a single horseman, am afraid of none. I come and go as I will. Think you I fear this Cao Cao? Let him sell his camp. I will take him after that. Now Cao Cao neared Paiying, and he made a camp. The next day he led out his commanders, and they arrayed their armies in open country. Cao Cao took up his station on horseback between the two standards, watching while his opponents arrived and formed up in a circular area. Lu Bu was in front followed by eight of his generals, all strong men, Zheng Liao of Mei, backed by Hao Meng, Cao Xing, and Cheng Lian, Zhang Ba Fuying, backed by Wai Zhu, Song Zion, and Hu Cheng. They led an army of 50,000 in total. The drums began their thunderous roll, and Cao Cao, pointing to his opponent, said, Yun I had no quarrel, why then did you invade my land? The cities of Han are the possession of all. What is your special claim? said Lu Bu. So saying, Lu Bu ordered Zhang Ba to ride forth and challenge. From Cao Cao's side the challenge was accepted by Yu Jing. The two steeds approached each other. Two spears were lifted both together, and they exchanged near thirty blows with no advantage to either. Then Zai Hudun rode out to help his colleague and, in reply, out went Zhang Liao from Lu Bu's side, and they four fought. Then Fear Sang seized upon Lu Bu. Selling his trident halberd, he urged his red hair forward to where the fight was waging. Seeing him approach, Sai Hudun and Yu Jing both fled, but Lu Bu pressed on after them, and Cao Cao's army lost the day. Retiring ten miles, they made a new camp. Lu Bu called in and mustered his troops. The day having gone against him, Cao Cao called a council, and Yu Jin said, From the hilltops today I saw a camp of our enemies on the west of Paiying. They were but few men therein, and tonight after today's victory, it will not be defended. Let us attack, and if we can take the camp, we shall strike fear into the heart of Lu Bu. This is our best plan. Cao Cao thought so too. He and six of his generals Cao Hong, Lai Dian, Mao Jai, Lu Kai and Yu Jin, and Dian Wine twenty thousand horse and foot left that night by a secret road for the camp. In his camp Lu Bu was rejoicing for that day's victory, when Chen Gong reminded him, saying, The western camp is important point, and it might be attacked. But Lu Bu replied, The enemy will not dare approach after today's defeat. Cao Cao is a very able commander, replied Chen Gong. You must keep a good lookout for him lest he attack our weak spot. So arrangements were made for defense. Generals Gao Shun, Wai Zhu, and Hu Cheng were ordered to march there. At dusk Cao Cao reached the camp and began an immediate attack on all four sides. The defenders could not hold him off. They ran in all directions, and the camp was captured. Near the fourth watch, when the defending party came, Cao Cao sallied forth to meet them and met Gao Shun. Another battle then began and waged till dawn. About that time a rolling of drums was heard in the west, and they told Cao Cao that Lu Bu himself was at hand. Thereupon Cao Cao abandoned the attack and fled. Gao Shun, Wai Zhu, and Hu Cheng pursued him, while Lu Bu blocked his escape route. Cao Cao's two generals, Yu Jin and Yu Jing, attacked Lu Bu's troops but could not break them. Cao Cao went away north, but from behind some hills came out Zhang Liao and Zhang Ba to attack. Lu Kain and Cao Hang were sent to stop the attackers, but Lu Kain and Cao Hang were both defeated. Cao Cao sought safety in the west. Here again his retreat was met by Lu Bu's four generals, Hao Meng, Cao Xing, Cheng Lian, and Song Zion. The fight became desperate. Cao Cao dashed at the enemy's array. The din was terrible. Arrows fell like pelting rain upon them, and they could make no headway. Cao Cao was desperate and cried out in fear, who can save me? Then from the crush dashed out Dian Wai with his double spears, crying, Fear not, my lord. Dian Wai leapt from his steed, put aside his double spears, 
and laid hold of a handful of barrel axes. Turning to his followers, he said, when the ruffians are at ten paces, call out to me. Then he set off with mighty strides, plunging forward, careless of the flying arrows. Lubu's horsemen followed, and when they got near, Diane Wai's followers shouted, ten paces, five, then call, shouted back Diane Wai, and went on, presently five paces. Then Diane Wai spun round and flung the barrel axes. With every fling a man fell from the saddle and never a barrel axe missed. Having thus slain ten or so the remainder fled, and Diane Wai quickly remounted his steed, set his twin spears and rushed again into the fight with a vigor that none could withstand. One by one his opponents yielded, and he was able to lead Cao Cao safely out of the press of barrel. Cao Cao and his commanders went to their camp. But as evening fell, the noise of pursuit fell on their ears, and soon appeared Lu Bu himself. Cow cow, you rebel, do not flee, shouted Lu Bu as he approached with his halberd ready for a thrust. All stopped and looked in each other's faces, the soldiers were weary, their steeds spent. Fear smote them, and they looked around for some place of refuge. You may lead your lord safely out of the press, but what if the enemy follow? We cannot say here what Cow Cow's fate was, but the next chapter will relate.